Hi. Uh, welcome, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about Cryo. Uh, I'm Rinal Patel. I'm the lead developer of Cryo. And uh, I'm also a maintainer of RunC and the OCI runtime specification. I work as a software engineer at Red Hat on containers. So let's go back and ask ourselves why, why Cryo was created. So if you look at the history of Kubernetes, in the beginning, Docker was the only supported runtime. And then CoreOS came along. They announced Rocket. And they wanted to integrate Rocket into Kubernetes. So the, the Rocket code path was another code path in Kubernetes. And then adding and maintaining runtimes was becoming a burden. So CRI, which is the short form of container runtime interface, was introduced in Kubernetes. So Kubernetes can decouple from the container runtimes. It's basically a gRPC-based API. So Kubelet implements the client side of the API. And anyone who's interested to plug in a new runtime can come in and implement the server side for the use cases. So the gRPC has different services. And the CRI consists of two services, the image service and the runtime service. So we'll go into some detail about what that means. So why cryo? So when the CRI came out, we asked ourselves, is it possible to create a minimal runtime using just standard pluggable components to satisfy the CRI so that it doesn't break as much and it's stable and you just implement the CRI and Kubernetes is happy and your workloads are stable? So what's the scope of the project? Scope is tied tightly to the CRI. Kubernetes is the only supported client, so there are no features that aren't required by CRI. Whenever CRI adds any new features, any new APIs, we implement them. That's it. And we maintain uh, support for past ver versions of Kubernetes, so we have branches corresponding to each version of Kubernetes that is supported. So, uh, let's took a, take a look at the components that make up Cryo. So the first question we need to answer is, what exactly makes up a container? What do you need to run a container? Whenever people think of containers, they think of pulling an image using Docker pull and running it somewhere. And what is an image? Image is the bits, are the bits that make up your container. So you could have a BusyBox image, you could have an HTTPD image, you can have an Nginx image. And these images are basically binaries that are stored in some registry made up of different layers. And you need a way to manage these images, to pull them down onto your system so you could run the binaries in, in the image. So we created this library called GitHub Containers Image. So it originally came from a tool called Scopio. Scopio's original scope was uh, reading the metadata about images from a remote registry. And then the scope increased. And we thought, why not just use it for pulling images and supporting various transports? So you can pull an image from one registry and copy it to another. You can support the OCI image format. You can uh, copy image into an OS tree local store, and so on. So it also supports image signature verification. It supports the OCI image specification V1 that came out earlier this year. And uh, most recent project that uses it is the Google's container diff tool. Uh, so once you get the image, you, you need a root file system for your container. So image is, image is a bunch of layers. And the next bit is how do you create a root file system from it? So Typically, we use copy on write file systems for exploding an image into a root file system. And we need a library for that. So uh, Red Hat contributed a bunch of drivers to Docker. And we thought that there's a good library to take out and make it reusable for everyone. So we took out that code and added support for new features such as NFS. And uh, that's the library that we use for pulling down an image and converting it into a root file system used for the container. 
And the most important bit, how do you actually run the container? So OCI came out with version one of the runtime specification earlier this year with RunC as a default implementation. And RunC has been in use in Docker for quite some time. And before that, it was libcontainer. So it, it's, it's proven code base, works, it's stable. Uh, so we decided to support any OCI compatible runtime in, in Cryo. So what does a runtime need? It needs a config.json. The config.json has the settings for the container. For example, what process is going to run on it, what are the environment variables, what capabilities you give it, what are your seccom settings, and so on. Basically, the settings that are translated to system calls in the Linux kernel to eventually launch a container. And runtime such as RunC implement, understand and implement uh, the spec to execute your container. And uh, so Intel came and they implemented clear containers, which is also OCI compliant and with minimal effort, we were able to plug that in because we support OCI compatible runtimes. And so Kata containers was announced uh, uh, yesterday and so it'll be supported soon in Cryo. So we also support mixed mode where on a single node, you can run some containers in RunC and others in clear containers through the use of pod annotations. So we have something called as a trusted runtime and untrusted workload runtime. So if you don't, if you want more security for your workload, then you would say that clear container is the runtime for untrusted workloads. And then Cryo would read that annotation and say, okay, this is untrusted, so I should be using clear containers instead of RunC for th this workload. And then finally, there's another small library that we use for generating the config.json. It's under, it's in OCI runtime tools. It's an open containers project. For networking, CNI is used for setting up uh, whatever plugin is configured. CNI has kind of become the standard for container networking, and most companies that are in that space have plugins that, that support CNI. So we have tested a bunch of them and pretty confident that any CNI plugin can be plugged into Cryo and it should just work. And then finally, uh, we have this monitoring utility called Conmon. So Conmon is responsible for monitoring the container process and detecting when it exits and storing its exit code. It's also responsible for collecting the logs from the container process and storing them in the CRI format. So CRI defines the format for how the runtime should store the logs so that Kubelet can understand them and interpret them. And uh, also, when you want like interactive terminals, Conmon is responsible for holding the master PTY and copying data back and forth from the container process. So it supports attached clients from, from Kubernetes. And then finally, it also supports uh, detection of out-of-memory conditions and reporting them uh, via kubectl describe. And because like uh, Conmon is the parent of your container, Cryo can be restarted without actually affecting any end of the running containers because Conmon is, is the parent. So this is what a Kubernetes pod looks like with RunC uh, in Cryo. So you have the pod, which is the holder of the IPC net and optionally the PID namespaces. And the pod also has a C group assigned to it. All the containers running inside the pod are under that C group and share these namespaces. And you can see that traditionally the Kubernetes had an infra container, which is the role of which is expanded now to also being a reaper for PID namespaces. So you can use a default Kubernetes POS container, or you can plug in your own. You can choose in its system of choice. It's, it's configurable in Cryo. And then corresponding to each container, we have Conmon. And you may think Conmon might be heavy, but it's like a lightweight, lightweight <coughs> monitoring agent written in C, and it uses shared libraries, so the memory overhead is pretty low. And this is what the architecture looks like with clear containers. I'll 
let Sam answer more questions about it later. <laughs> so uh, this is what the node looks like uh, with Cryo in the picture. So on the left, you have your kubelet talking gRPC to Cryo. Cryo implements the image service and the runtime service. The image service is responsible for making sure that the image that is requested in a pod is available on the node. So Kubelet basically queries Cryo, uses the image service to see if an image is present. If it is not present, it issues a pull on the image, and ultimately it ends up calling into the container's image library. And for the runtime service, it's, we use the OCI generate library to create the config.json. So config.json is basically converted from uh, so, so the kubelet sends a bunch of settings as part of the create container API, and those are translated into a config.json. And then container storage library is used to create a root file system. And finally, CNI plugins are used to set up the networking. So CNI is very orthogonal. So it just takes a network namespace. And before the container is started, it goes into the network namespace and does what it needs to. And sets up an IP address that is returned to the kubelet. And then on top, you can see a couple of pods running similar to the diagram that we saw earlier. So what's the status of the project? So we pass all end-to-end -end tests, the CRI tools tests, and some 100-odd test integration tests that we have added. So we're passing more than like 300 tests on each pull request. We are dedicated to Kubernetes. No pull requests are merged without passing all of these tests. Uh, we released 1.0 a few months back, and the supported version of Kube was 1.7x. After that, we decided to make it easy. Since our only user is Kube, we just match Kube versions. So 1.8 of Cryo supports Kube 1.8. And right now, we, we just released like 1.9 beta last week, and we are tracking uh, Cube 1.9 releases. So as soon as Cube 1.9 is out, I think we should be able to release Cryo 1.9 within, within a week. We are passing all the tests for 1.9. And we have maintainers and contributors from Red Hat, Intel, Suzy, and many others. So now let's jump into some demos to see this thing in action. So I've set up a local node. It's up and running, and it's using Cryo as a runtime. So you can see Cryo is running as a systemd service. Now let's see if, if any pods are running. You can see nothing is running. Uh, we'll try to run a simple HTTPD pod. So I'm basically starting a deployment called MyWeb, and I'm saying the image I want is HTTPD version 2.4, and let's run it. Let's see the status of the pod. So OK, so since I pulled the image earlier, it didn't take any time at all to start. So you can see the status. Uh, it was pulled, it was created, and started. And then. You can see it running here. Let's try to curl it and see if it responds. So let's see if our logging integration is working fine. So you're able to see the three gets corresponding to the curls that I just did earlier. So this basically sh shows uh, the create and the start API calls in CRI being exercised, and also that the logging, the logs are in the right format because Kubelet because is able to read them. Now let's try exec. We are able to exec into the container. Let's see what's running inside. Say HTTPD as expected. Oh, 
let's try running an interactive container. So we are able to run like run a busybox container. So this is basically demonstrating the attach API. We are able to launch a container, give it a TTY, and Kubelet is able to connect to Conmon, which is proxying the TTY back and forth from the container process, and it, it all works. Resize an action, basically. Let's take a closer look at what's happening behind the scenes for the My Web pod. So, so this is Cryo CTL. It's like a debug CLI for Cryo. And the output is very verbose. We are moving to another upstream CRI tools project, which which has a better CLI, but right now this can do for debugging. So I got the ID of the container for the MyWeb pod, and let's see what's actually happening. So this is just a run C container under, underneath. So you can see that it's visible to run C. In fact, you can even run C exec into it. You can see the same output that you saw from the cube CTL exec. And then for C groups, we have two options. You can either use the C group FS or you can use systemd C groups. So on this node, I have set up prior to use systemd C groups. So I can do, I can run like some systemd commands and actually see what's happening inside the container. So we can query system control status and we give it the name cryo-id, so you can see HTTPD running inside the container. And we have another slice for conmon, which is conveniently named cryo-conmon-id. It has some debug information about bytes being written in and out, which can be disabled optionally. So this, and you can see like, so Conmon is the parent of the, the HTTPD container, and it, it's, it's responsible for the terminal copying back and forth, as you can see the total bytes written over there. And then uh, let's try another example. Let's try running a job. So this is a pi calculation job. It's completed. <laughs> it uses Perl. The image is huge, so I pulled it ahead of time. It calculates like 2,000 digits of pi after the decimal. This also shows the logging in action, the multiple chunks and they are all being read correctly back. So basically, like through this demo, we can see that the CRI is completely implemented and supported. As a Kubernetes user, you don't even need to know the details of what is actually happening behind the scenes. You, you can use all the Kubernetes APIs and commands that you use today, and it all just works with Cryo. So besides that, we have a couple of other demos that you're welcome to check out from the slides. So one is for uh, kubeadm support and mixed workloads, where we demonstrate running uh, run C and clear containers side by side on the same node. And the second one is supporting uh, different nodes and with different distros running in them, like one is an Ubuntu and one is a Fedora node, and everything just works together nicely. So what are the next steps for the project? So at, at this point, we're just tracking and supporting Kubernetes versions. Uh, we'll be releasing 1.9 soon, I think mid-December when Kube 1.9 is released. 
And besides that, we keep an eye on issues and bugs that goes in, go into Cube, and we pick them into our stable branches. So we are supporting our 10x one, branch for Cube 1.7 and our 1.8 branch for Cube 1.8. We have our blog here on Medium, and is our GitHub, and we are available on IRC, Hashcryo. Also, one more thing, I think I forgot the slide. So we are working on another tool called Kpod, and will soon be renamed. So what is Kpod? So Kpod is basically a serverless debugging utility for Cryo. So you can use Cryo with, with Kubernetes, but what if you want to go and do things uh, under the hood and see what's happening? So you can use Kpod to pull images, tag images, push images. You can do Kpod PS to list all the running containers and so on. The CLI is very similar to Docker, so it's easier to use it. The big difference being that Kpod shares storage with Cryo, so whatever you pull or do with Kpod, is available to cryo instantly, and also it doesn't have a daemon. So, would... okay. Uh, any questions? When is OpenShift going to support this? Yeah. So uh, we're planning uh, for OpenShift online to use cryo, and that is in progress. We are targeting using. Uh, Kubernetes 1.8 and OpenShift 3.8, which is based on Cube 1.8. Uh, there's one question. Why does the logo working? Why does the logo look like a snowflake? Uh, uh, so actually, it, it, it comes from the name. So we, cryo, cryogenics, and so we went with a snowflake and. We thought, why not make it special, <laughs> like a snowflake? Hi. Uh, do you consider this production ready? It's, it's, it's like feature, there's feature parity between, uh, as a Kubernetes user, there's full feature parity between uh, Docker and... Uh, y yes, absolutely. Like, and the, I mean, if you want any confidence in that, you can see that each pull request and cryo master passes all the end-to-end -end tests in Kubernetes. So you can run all the tests, and you can see our results. In, yeah. Sorry, just addition to the previous question. And the log formats are also kind of the same, right? So we just switch from Docker to Cryo, and uh, we do custom parsing of the logs. We will not have to rewrite anything there. Uh, can you repeat? So you, you, want to, you want to know what to do with the logs? No, no. Uh, you mentioned that there is a certain format uh, right. for the logs, uh, which is understand, understood by Kubernetes. Uh, is that uh, mechanism the same like with Docker? Uh, no, the, the log format is different from okay. the Docker JSON format. And so like, I know that uh, Kubernetes folks have made changes to the FluentD plugin to understand the CRI log format. And it's, it's a fairly simple format to understand. Like, it's probably 50 lines to write code to parse that. OK, so we'll probably, so anyone who wants to uh, ac accomplish successful transition from Docker to Cryo will have to escape the payload of the logs and wrap it into the new format, right? Right. I mean, any log, any, anything that consumes logs from containers directly will have to understand the CRI format. And it's not just, I mean, any CRI compatible runtime has to output the logs in this new format. Yeah. So if you plan to switch from Docker to anything that's CRI based, you will have to transition to the CRI format. Hey, sorry if I miss it. Um, my question is about CRI. We're seeing CRIs everywhere. Uh, how is Cryo different from ContainerD, for example? Like, what would, how do I pick Cryo over the others, Docker or? <laughs> uh, great question. So I think, like, so, so with, with CRI, right, Kubernetes got out of the business of 
picking the runtime for you. And everyone who has a use case for how they want their runtime to work now has the ability to either implement a runtime or evaluate all the runtimes that are available and pick and choose what they want. So Cryo is very tied to Kubernetes. So if you want something that is closely tied to Kubernetes, you might choose it. Containerd has an API, so it can be used with Kubernetes as well as for other workloads. So best would be for you to evaluate them and see what works. I mean, you can take a look at the overall architecture. So one thing we have is like one, we have one fewer daemon than Containerd. So. So, sorry, um, so does this simplify, um, let's say, the upgrade capabilities of OpenShift uh, toward the release of the different Creos uh, versions rather than relying on Docker, where every time Docker is updated, OpenShift breaks out, you know, you, all of those upgrade cycle challenges that we've, we've seen with, with, the, with OpenShift? So so, so I think that's one of the challenges that we've had with Kubernetes and OpenShift. So we wanted something that just supports whatever Kubernetes needs, and we hope that the disruption is none too minimal. As long as your gRPC maintains backwards compatibility, the upgrades should be better. Yeah, because like in 1.9, there was bar barely anything new added. Only thing that changed was the couple of debug APIs and the, and the CRA logging format had an issue which was fixed, but the rest of the runtime and the image API was unchanged. So nothing should have broken moving from moving cube from 1.8 to 1.9. You mentioned we should evaluate the differences between different runtimes. How trivial or not is it to plug cryo into your existing nodes, or do you have to change your whole cluster over? How does that work? Uh, so uh, can you just repeat? I didn't get your entire question. If I want to give cryo a test run, how would I do so? So yeah, it's, so, uh, it's very easy to start up cryo. So all you need to do is, uh, when you start Kubernetes, you need to point it to the cryo endpoint after you, after you have started your cryo server. We have RPMs and Debian's available everywhere. So you can install those easily. You can point your Kubernetes to the cryo socket, and it'll start talking to cryo. And besides that, uh, we also have Minikube integration available. So you should be able to download a new version of Minikube and play with cryo to see how it all works. And uh, besides, our performance team is doing work testing cryo to see what the overhead is. And we'll soon be able to publish numbers comparing it with Docker. Okay. As of OpenShift 3.7, we're shipping uh, Cryo with uh, OpenShift, so it's just setting an environmental variable if you want to run it on top of a rel system. Yeah, but it's like, yeah, for OpenShift, it's just an Ansible variable. You say OpenShift use Cryo equal to true, and Ansible will set up OpenShift with yeah. Cryo. It's, it's tech preview in uh, 3.7, Docker's still at fault, and the goal is for 3.9 to make it fully supported underneath uh, underneath uh, OpenShift. Yep. Any other questions? All right, thanks everyone for joining.